So in this video, we're going to wrap up our series on photosynthesis uh, as part three of our series, finishing up by looking at the light independent reactions and a few more topics on photosynthesis specifically. Uh, previously, we've talked about um, the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis, um, the two different photosystems and how light is used uh, to create NADPH and a little bit of ATP and a result of that oxygen O2 is, is produced. And so in this portion, we're going to focus more specifically on the light dependent reactions over here. Uh, excuse me, the light independent reactions uh, where light is not necessary. And really overall what's happening here is we're using CO2 to produce sugars. In this process, this cycle is called the Calvin cycle. And so we're going to look at this a little bit more closely uh, in detail here. So the light independent reactions, um, we start with uh, CO2. CO2 is what's, what's being used to drive this whole process. And so CO2 molecules enter this cycle uh, one at a time, but three CO2 molecules enter. And there's the, this process is divided up into three different stages. The first phase, phase one, is carbon fixation. And that's actually putting together these carbon molecules. And what, what is driving this is a molecule called Robisco. Uh, and Robisco is going to be connected to a molecule of CO2. So Robisco is a five carbon molecule. And if we add a CO2 uh, molecule to it, uh, we create a, uh, a six carbon molecule. Now the six carbon molecule is really, really unstable. And it has um, a tendency, and it does, break apart very easily and very quickly. Um, and when it does so, it breaks apart into two separate three carbon molecules. So we've gone from Rubisco, which is a five carbon molecule, and as we'll see, we go all the way back and end the process with Rubisco. And by adding CO2, um, we've created a six carbon molecule right here that's very unstable, and so then that splits into two three carbon molecules. Now, a couple of different uh, steps happen um, to finish uh, or, or to begin phase two, and, and that's the process of reducing those three carbon molecules. Um, and the first process or part of that is adding ATP. So ATP is actually used in the Calvin cycle. Um, that ATP is necessary. And uh, in the first step, in the first step, uh, ATP is going to be added. Um, to each of these molecules. And so we've got our three carbon molecule now has two phosphates on it. Now in our diagram here it says 6 ATP converted to 6 ADP. Remember that we've started with a six carbon molecule that's split into two. So we really have two of these molecules that are that are occurring uh, that this process is, is going through at once. Additionally we started with three carbon molecules. So overall uh, starting with three carbon molecules and three rubisco, this is entering it one at a time. And because that six carbon molecule splits into two, we're using six ATP here um, to, to, to create this molecule that's three carbons with two phosphates. NADPH is going to be used uh, to, to give this molecule um, a hydrogen ion. And so we get this three carbon molecule here that has one phosphate. Uh, we call this three carbon molecule G3P. Now G3P is only a three carbon molecule and uh, simple monosaccharide sugars such as glucose, um, for example, we know are six carbon molecules. Well, through overall this process, um, G3Ps are being produced. And so if those uh, G3P molecules, if two of them are put together and the phosphates are removed, uh, we get a six carbon molecule that is glucose. Um, the, the last portion of this process, the third phase, is really the regeneration of this Rubisco molecule. So Rubisco is kind of almost just kind of the transport mechanism for carbon dioxide. It's what's going to bond with carbon dioxide at the beginning, kind of guide these carbons through the process, and then it gets recycled and reused. And so that the process just again continues. Um, now again, uh, going back towards the beginning, we said talked about how the six carbon molecule at the beginning splits into two, three carbon molecules. One of them is released after being slightly modified with ATP and NADPH. Uh, one of them is released as G3P. The other continues through the cycle. And this is actually what's going to be used 
to create um, our Rubisco again. And in order for this to occur, uh, ATP again is required. We're going to use three ATP molecules. We're going to use three ATP molecules um, in those five remaining G3P molecules um, to recreate Rubisco. Um, and, and so through this whole process, uh, we're using a total of, uh, excuse me, nine ATP, six NADPH uh, to produce this G3P molecule that's going to be used and combined with another to produce sugar. So let's take a look at these uh, different phases in a little bit more detail. For phase one, this is really our carbon fixation, adding those carbons together. CO2 molecules attached to a five carbon sugar. Um, the rubicose enzyme catalyzes the reaction. Uh, the six carbon molecule is extremely unstable until it begins to it actually splits into two three carbon molecules. In our second phase of reduction, phosphates are added to each three carbon molecule from ATP. So we get ADP from ATP. A pair of electrons from NADPH reduce that carbon molecule. The carbon molecule loses a phosphate group and becomes G3P. And G3P is a three carbon sugar, as I mentioned. Uh, it's the same as what's formed during glycolysis. And one of those G3P exits the cell for, for use to, to create a sugar, and the remaining five are recycled in order to recreate Rubisco. And so that phase three, this is actual um, regeneration of Rubisco, of the CO2 acceptor. And so the remaining G3P molecules are rearranged into, um, into that re Rubisco shape. The process, uh, Rubisco molecule, excuse me, the process uses ATP and um, it creates Rubisco in order to receive the CO2. So kind of our overall net reaction, what we're seeing overall here, is that we get one G3P sugar. We get a consumption of nine ATP and six NADPH. Um, and then the important part here is we're producing this uh, this sugar. Those ATP molecules um, coming from respiration inside the plant as well as uh, from the electron transport chain a little bit, which we'll take a look at a little bit more here in a second. And the NADPH is also coming from the electron transport chain. So really all of these molecules are just being recycled um, and the driving force for all of this is the light energy uh, that's captured in the different photosystems. The next portion that we want to look at is phosphorylation by uh, chemosmosis. And, and really what this is, is the process of producing ATP by moving molecules, uh, hydrogen ions in this case, across uh, a gradient from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And so if we're looking at our uh, thylakoid here, um, thylakoid space, here's the membrane, here's the stroma. Um, through the electron transport chain, water goes in, light energy is used to split uh, those protons and so we get oxygen and we get hydrogens are being separated those electron electrons move through the electron transport chain and are used to create NADPH which is then used in the Calvin cycle well also through that process we've produced hydrogen ions these hydrogen ions when water is split from the light energy accumulate inside of this thylakoid space and so we get a really high concentration of hydrogen ions. This is very similar to what we saw in the electron transport chain for cellular respiration as well, kind of the same idea. This enzyme in the, in the membrane, uh, ATP synthase, um, allows these hydrogen ions to move across the membrane. And as they move across that membrane, it, it forces the, the ATP synthase to turn, and in doing so, it provides the, the mechanism or the energy to combine an ADP with a phosphate group. And in doing so, we combine that phosphate with an ADP molecule and create ATP. And so then the NADPH and the ATP can be used in the Calvin cycle. Um, so to kind of summarize all of, all of this, uh, it's the movement of ions across a selectively permeable membrane. Uh, again, we're splitting H2O water by light energy to create hydrogen ions. The electron transport chain is moving ions across the membrane from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And the diffusion of hydrogen ions down a concentration gradient creates ATP from ADP by use of the enzyme ATP synthase. To kind of finish up here, we want to look at the action spectrum versus absorption spectrum. And both of these are best uh, viewed by, by actually looking at graphs. Um, the action spectrum, really we're looking at the, um, 
the rate um, uh, of effectiveness of, of, of photosynthesis at different wavelengths. And so in our two graphs here, we've got our wavelengths in nanometers. Uh, 400 would be violets, 700 here down red. And in the first one, in A, we're looking at the relative absorption. And we can actually break this apart and look at this by different pigments here. So we've got a couple of different uh, types of pigments, chlorophyll A and B, and we can see where these different pigments are absorbing the most amount of light, the relative absorption. Um, so blue, uh, kind of bluish violet light here, uh, having very high absorption, and then no absorption in the green area, which is why uh, as we discussed, uh, plants reflecting that green light, why we see them as green. Um, and then some absorption here around the 650, 680 here, uh, kind of the orangish reddish color. If we compare that to the second graph here, which is looking at relative effectiveness in photosynthesis, we see how um, this would be how effective uh, photosynthesis occurs at different colors, different wavelengths. Um, we see that there's very high effectiveness in the violet, so especially kind of the blue-violet colors, uh, with a very steep decline in the green region, and then an increase, um, not quite as high, but still an increase in the yellow and the orange area. And if we combine both of these together, it can provide um, an overall um, kind of analysis of, of what pigments um, and what uh, wavelengths um, are, are providing or, or are most effective in, in plants being able to photosynthesize. So the act action spectrum, excuse me, is a graph, as we just saw, identifying the rate of photosynthesis compared to wavelength. And so that is this second one here, B. It's the relative effectiveness in photosynthesis. We're comparing the rate um, on, our, on our Y axis to the wavelength in our X axis. The absorption spectrum is a graph identifying the degree of absorption at different wavelengths. So we're looking at how much light is absorbed at different wavelengths. And again, we can separate this by pigment types. And by combining these two different graphs, we're looking, um, it indicates the effectiveness of photosynthesis at different light spectrums. So we're really looking at how effective uh, photosynthesis occurs or, or takes place at these different spectrums. And generally, in the most part, it's most effective at approximately kind of around 420 nanometers and 680 nanometers uh, as different experiments have shown and observed. To finish up our discussion of photosynthesis, we want to take a look at some limiting factors, uh, things that uh, could limit the overall rate or the effectiveness of photosynthesis. And you think about what is necessary in order for photosynthesis to occur. Sunlight being one of the most important and one of the most obvious. Um, carbon dioxide, especially uh, for the Calvin cycle in order to produce that sugar. And then water primarily to drive that electron transport chain. And so uh, factors affecting the photosynthesis, um, limiting factors could be light intensity, temperature, and CO2. Um, limiting factor reactant input available in short supply so that the reaction is limited. It's kind of a general definition for limiting factors. Um, and so within photosynthesis, light intensity, temperature, CO2 can all influence the rate of photosynthesis. And those can be limiting factors. Um, if there's not enough light, if there's not enough CO2, if the temperature is too high or too low, uh, these can all influence the rate of photosynthesis and therefore can be limiting factors. That sums up our overall discussion of photosynthesis. We'll get some more practice in class, actually looking at this uh, with different plants um, and kind of measuring overall rates, as well as have some more practice in walking through these different steps and mechanisms.